my question, I, I started by uh, saying, I hope this would be something like stone soup, uh, that, that everyone would have something to contribute. So my question for each of us is, what, what would you offer into this soup as part of a recipe for spiritual well-being in these challenging times? What would you offer into this stone soup as your part of the recipe yeah. for um, spiritual well-being in these challenging times? Yes, sir. Len likes that. Okay. So there's about, what, about 10 of us who are going to have the opportunity to respond, and we, we have maybe 20 minutes or so. So I'd say roughly if we each... Um, uh, can take a, a couple of minutes to offer our response, and then everyone has a chance. I want to remind everyone that at um, 10.30 West Coast time, 1.30 East Coast time, uh, Charles has got to leave. But after we bring the formal conversation to a close, uh, we'll have time for the uh, After Hours Club for a few of us who would like to, to keep going. So I will call on you and, and whatever, you know, whenever you signal that you're ready to uh, respond to Charles's question. And after two minutes, you'll hear a chime. Who would like to start your contribution to the stone soup of spiritual well-being? Okay, Len. I just to add an experience. We were recently <clears throat> asked to... Um, be part of a, a day in Redding, California, sponsored by the um, Euphrates Institute. And we were asked to do a Q&A on really the life that you're talking about, Charles. And Libby and I agreed that when we were handed the wi handheld wireless microphones, we denied doing a Q&A. And instead, Libby walked down one side of the room. There were about 85 the, the, the sheriff, the, the rotary, the, all the people, the indigenous people were there, youth, and we just walked through there giving them the microphones. So uh, it, it was a way that we felt was useful to, um, uh, to reverse this idea that things come from the top and, and to really give them the experience of the people uh, expressing what that day of relationship building had meant to them and to help them create community and give a voice to the people. Thank you, Len. I'll go ahead and go next. Um, Terry's question, uh, I want to put a little bit more uh, of my spin on it. In the last year, she and I have been working after the election of that person to really figure out politically how to change things. And we started out supporting one candidate and we got to know him pretty well. And we said, yeah, he's not for us. And the reason he wasn't for us because he wasn't talking about what you're talking about, Charles. He wasn't talking about engagement. He was talking about his ideas and how those ideas ought to come. He really was running for a job. And so what I'm struggling with personally and, and what you said was really helpful was engaging people when we go door to door, we did that in Iowa this year and we did it in Costa Mesa this year, is engaging people to how they can create their voice and how they can learn to take that voice uh, into the political realm. Now, we all know when we get into the political realm, it gets scary. But if you're talking about engagement and, and not attachment to the outcome, I can see this can be real powerful because we have to do something about the political realm. It's scary what's out there. And if we can do it from a perspective of empowering people and where they can feel they have a part of, of, of making this happen rather than having somebody tell them what to do, I think we'll, so I'm really encouraged by what you said. I think that'll be helpful to us and what we're doing in California, Southern California. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Who else would like to respond? What's, what's your stone that you put in the stone soup of spiritual well-being? Libby. Okay. Um, I think the thing that I would like to contribute is just not to give up hope. Uh, so often when we're with a circle of people, we'll hear people feeling very despairing, 
Um, you know, things seem to be out of control. What gives you hope? What keeps you going? And I think we have a choice. We can either hold on to what is not working or we can build on what is working. And I, I've found in, in our life, in our activities, there are lots of things that are working. It isn't always in, in the headlines in the news, but I think if we can each hold on to the experiences that we have that are so positive, we see what works, we know what works, we understand about relationships and listening and what it means to love in every situation. If we can just keep putting that into the stone soup and stirring that into the pot, I think it will go a long way to help other people hang on to the uh, positive and keep working for the, the future that we would like to see. So I guess I would just keep putting hope and positive stories back into the pot. Thank you, Libby. I think, uh, oh, okay, go ahead, Terry. Wait, wait, have you responded? We'll, we'll keep the pattern where Lynn taught Lynn Bob and then Libby will make. <laughs> Go for it, go for it. <laughs> Thanks, Bob, for what you said. I'm just gonna bring it to the day-to-day -day and just a small example of what, we're planning a family vacation in July and we have extroverts that are there, put their ideas right in. We have introverts that stand back and want to be included and then don't include, and then people that want action and people that want contemplation. And so I've experienced where I've had an intuition that something wasn't right because somebody wasn't included and I didn't act on it. So really what I want to develop more is my voice in inclusion and encouraging inclusion and allowing space for everyone to come in with their voice and what they know and having a group ending. So my concentration is on inclusiveness and, and developing that more. Thank you, Terry. Ofu. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh Charles, Reverend Charles, it's a pleasure to meet you. This unusual opportunity to meet you online on this meeting. Um I'm very, very inspired with your story of what you are doing so much humanly with your love for humanity in Syria alone. When you are narrating stories i see myself in what you're doing because we in ivory coast experience similar situations that syria alone experienced and some other part of west africa in syria in the Côte d'Ivoire. i see how you I understand how you go to many villages that are even afraid of seeing a stranger coming close to them after having experienced some situations very horrible from people they know that have been their neighbors we experience the same and see how we are creating such situation, trying to bridge the gaps of fears and ignorance of the people that have killed and destroyed their community with a hopeless situation whereby we try to let them know there is hope, that the people you see as enemies are friends, but because of differences in how you see the other as an enemy cause the relationship that would have been helped this community to develop broken. So I understand what you have passed through in Syria alone. Um, I'm so inspired with your experience. Uh, my organization in Cote d'Ivoire is working in that vein to strengthen communities, to equip communities after post-electoral violence to equip mostly youth with the leadership and the communication skill necessary to address the root cause of hatred, discrimination, conflict, violence. We take part in going to villages where even government institutions could not reach and we're able to facilitate a difficult reconciliation process in Cote d'Ivoire 
on a tribal level whereby people kill themselves, burn themselves, buried pregnant women alive, the whole villages in terms of exterminating a particular tribe. So, uh, your question is, is what I choose as a lifestyle. Oh, sorry, I don't have enough time. Your question is what I choose as a lifetime. Um, please just give me one minute just to round up. Uh, for me, I see that the problem we are facing today in the world is a problem, I call it a spiritual level. Because I discovered that personally, for one to manifest compassion and love to the other, it should be a step back from your intellectual muscles, what I call intellectual muscle, and come step out from what I call that religious culture, or uh, that ethnic tribal uh, 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 tradition, and embrace that interconnectedness of seeing the other as one. And for me, to, con to just summarize what I know, what I can say called peace. Peace is about P, which stands for protection, and E stands for elevation, and A, advancement, and C, comforting the other, and E, the education with the background. So I believe that what we are doing and what we have been doing for me to contribute to this world for the challenges that we have today is to offer the spiritual quality in all human race to embrace the other as one. And we cannot do it through our intellectual muscles. We can only do it through igniting the spiritual awakening and establishing the consciousness of women to see the other as one. Thank you. So this is what we are doing and we do it passionately. Thank, thank you. you for, uh, thank you for joining us all the way from Cote d'Ivoire. It's, it's an honor to have you with us. Um, Wendy. Um, well, I would like to add music to our soup. Um, I have found that when you're talking about taking care of your core, when I feel sometimes the most despairing or, you know, I'm, you know, not feeling well because of what's been going on, both in terms of self-care uh, music has been just uh, so important to me uh, in terms of um, uplifting my spirit and also to join others in music. It's such a beautiful way of connnecting now my, my challenge is uh, one of my challenges is um, connecting with my stepson's music because he has a, he's a music a musician but with a little punk there and I haven't quite learned how to uh, connect with that. <laughs> But um, just, and, and just the chorus that I'm in, just and music gives a way of just really truly listening, you know, listening to others and also joining the, the whole body of everybody in terms of listening to the music that is both coming at us and also the music that we're joining together and making. So that's my contribution is music. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I noticed that uh, our friend Usman Mohammed in a way has joined us from uh, from Nigeria. Uh, Usman, uh, we've been going for about an hour now, but uh, but welcome and uh, glad you can uh, be here for this part of it. Uh, we're responding to Charles's question, which each of us uh, have two minutes to respond to his question, which is, what is the stone we're each get to put in the stone soup of, of, of hope and, and positive action in uh, the challenging times in today's world. So who, um, who would like to go next, respond to that question? Um, Susan, you're looking thoughtful. Okay. Well, <clears throat> as an introvert, of course, you know, it, it takes me a while to process everything and and roll it around so probably by tomorrow I could answer the question uh, more more completely but what the word that keeps coming to me is emptiness and um, perhaps it's 
because of my situation right now of leaving a position and, and going through a, a process of trying to figure, get, get my head around what it means to be um, moving into retirement, but also moving into some something, into something in the future that's coming. And it certainly will be around action, social action and spiritual action. But I'm, I'm sensing this need also for this emptiness of allowing myself to be completely open, completely open and not attached to what I think the actions should be, what the plan should be, my right, what, what my brain tells me the right thing to do is. And so a time of allowing the, the divine process within me to work itself and trusting that that will be something that is going to be for the benefit of of all for for the world so i I guess that's just my own my own um contribution right now ironically to put into the soup is emptiness pastor susan thank you wonderful to have you with us um I'm going to go. Um, I must say, my stone, I, I sort of like borrow or polish my stone from, um, from most of you who, who I'm seeing here right now, from uh, Lennon Libby, especially of uh, In Dark Times, learning that I may not be able to agree with half of America or a third of America out there on, on what's right for our country right now but I can agree with everyone that we're all human, that we all have stories, that we can uh, become friends by listening to each other's stories. So I, I want to especially thank the two of you for uh, being my teachers in that regard. I'm feeling like when things look so terrible uh, in this country and in other parts of the world, I also have to take a lesson from you, Charles, and uh, maybe take a little news break for a while. And, you know, look for that light in the darkness. Uh, the teachings in, in our tradition in Jewish mysticism is that the darkest places are the places where the brightest sparks of light are hid hidden. And my stone is to sort of hold that teaching and remember that and look for those sparks of light. And those sparks of light uh, in almost all cases are the acts of ordinary people, the small acts of kindness, compassion, humility, friendship, love. Um, so my stone for the soup is to sort of be alert, pay attention for those opportunities when it looks so dark, uh, to find the chance to connect with other people and have that light uh, continue to grow. Um, Bonita. So I want to thank you again for this wonderful conversation. Ever since we began this process, I mean, in, in this country, and people have talked about resistance, I keep thinking about the old transformational phrase that I was, uh, grew up in for a number of years, that you become what you resist. Uh, so that I, it's like I've been resisting, like I don't want to resist. I don't want to become them. Uh, what is it that I can do? So, you know, this positive um, building on what is good, what is working, I think is uh, another way of saying that 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 uh, it's not about resistance; it's about building. And I would add one more piece for me personally that has more of the spiritual piece to it. Um, you know, I'm actually I have only recently discovered the imp the centrality of the what is the common good in uh, the Christian um, and other traditions uh, in the in the Old Testament what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament I purposely had been exploring this for wanting to know how the American culture is shaped by our traditions and for me to use that as just asking people in the conversation what do you see as the common good um, is a is a way of steering 
myself in a conversation that otherwise could be uh, polarizing. And um, I just want to bring that out and also acknowledge that it was, it was for me to only discover this at my age, that this is so central and that social justice is so central to the um, religious culture of, of this country and of many other countries it was really um, startling and uh, at once miraculous, but also disappointing that it had taken so long. So I, I want, just would like to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Bonita. Victor. Well, thank you. Gee, <laughs> I'm overwhelmed by the profundity of everyone, especially from coming from a personal place that everybody does. I would, when I think about my own work now, um, you get to a certain point in life where you want to take from the all the things that you're engaged in and start narrowing it down to where the greatest meaning um, emerges. And for me, it's become, uh, to use the term that uh, the theologian Matthew Fox used, uh, coined, deep ecumenism. I've gotten to the point in my life, having served the Jewish people for so long, that I can no longer engage in um, particularism and post-triumphal uh, life. Uh, well, I want to be in post-triumphal life. I experience so much triumphal life that my engagement now is really with people of, of um, a variety of spiritual traditions and religion. And that to recognize that, um, as Fox explains what deep ecumenism is, that there's an underground river, which is the <laughs> river of the divine, and that there are many wells, and all those wells are represented by uh, different spiritual traditions, or not even a spiritual tradition. And that is, Maury said in Tuesday with Maury, we'll either learn to love one another or we will die. And I am convinced of that. And that's where I think that we are at a wonderful point in history where religion, various religions have recognized their sins and are starting to correct them with the emergence of the new, you know, the emerging church and, and, and spirituality for whatever it means is taking over what used to be the sins of religion and becoming in, in its individual expression, a more universal focus on peace and reconciliation. And so Charles, I got the language. I may have missed some of the, some of the message, but I got the language. And I just want to, to thank everybody for, in this time, as, as Arye was referring to it, we're entering into the darkest time of the year. And yet two traditions, well, more than two traditions actually, have festivals of light. And let's just celebrate the light in the darkness because it, as Crosby, Stills, and Nash said, it's always darkest before the dawn. Thank you. <laughs>